Our second speaker this afternoon is Dr. George Doshek from the Naval Research Lab, who's in the Solar Physics Division and uh, an award-winning astrophysicist from, uh, from the Solar Physics Division of the American Astronomical Society. I don't remember mm -hmm. the name of the award, but I remember it was just mm -hmm. last year. Uh, he's been doing this for a very long time, a lot of it from satellite-based solar physics. Mm -hmm. But we invited him to speak this afternoon on the nature of the sun that we will be seeing at the solar eclipse, what it means, the corona, the chromosphere, the prominences, uh, why it appears the way it does. So with that, I'll introduce Dr. George Doshek. It's rather easy, actually, to be a professional solar physicist. Uh, you don't have to learn that much because actually we don't understand, really, when you get into the corona, how things really work. We have ideas and can talk a lot but we don't have any answers. So if somebody says, well, what causes a solar flare? Well, you say um, it's probably uh, magnetic reconnection, which that's the favorite way to explain everything. I'll tell you what that is later. Or well, it could be waves. Uh, you know, I don't know, it's just a big bang. This is some sort of explosion. Nobody knows everything for sure. We do know a few things about the sun for sure. We do know that the core of the sun is a thermonuclear reactor. Hydrogen's what made into helium. And uh, this energy radiates out towards the, uh, the surface of the sun. There's a radiative zone. And then at some point, uh, radiation, the density is falling. This is like 15 million degrees. And the density falls to the extent that radiation alone can't carry all the energy. So you need to start boiling and convecting it. So that by the time the energy gets to the surface, uh, you have this like a boiling pot, uh, which is emitting radiation as well as convective motions. Uh, Right here at this line is something called the tachocline. It's not marked. And it's at this point where some sort of a dynamo is set up and you get a, sol you get a magnetic field. And the magnetic field is really important in determining what you see during an eclipse. And here are a few things marked that you know about prominences, flares, the corona, and so on and so forth. Um, I study the sun mainly from space vehicles, so I don't look at the sun in the visible. That's, uh, Mostly I look in the sun in the extreme ultraviolet, the ultraviolet, and also x-rays. And these aren't visible to the eye, but when you're looking at really explosive events like solar flares, that's where most of the emission, most of the radiation is occurring. It's in the x-ray region. Uh, however, we're I'm here to talk about the sort of a total structure of the sun and not details. Sure. Oh, it comes from the, the corona, it come, but, but it's an emerging magnetic flux tube which erupts and it's got a cold component and, and then it, what it does is it pushes outward through the corona and sweeps it up and, and, and pushes it into like a, what's called a croissant. <laughs> or, you know, regular, like a croissant you get from a French bakery and that's coronal material. But, I'll, I'll get, but see, you ask me exactly how does that work? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's not figured out yet. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, what we have, the surface of the sun, whoops, uh, the surface of the sun has sunspots. The sunspots are cool regions on the sun, where, but they have very strong magnetic fields. And the magnetic fields actually inhibit the convection right below them, and if so they're cooler by a couple thousand degrees in the sur from the surface. This is where the field is strongest. It, and as, as you're going to see, the magnetic field is a controlling influence on the corona. Right at the surface, if you look in detail around the sunspot, you see these little bright things, they're called granules. It's like the boiling of a pot of water. This is the energy coming up in the convection zone. And these things move around and they push the magnetic field around in them. And pushing in the magnetic field, uh, the magnetic field actually goes out in the corona, stresses the field. And the field contains energy. And it's the release of energy in that, those stresses that, that might, in fact, heat the corona. At any rate, granules about 620 miles in size. It gives you an idea of how big they are. The surface of the sun is about 5,800 degrees Kelvin. Now, in the space vehicle, you can look at the sun in extreme ultraviolet. And uh, this is an image in helium, I think, helium 304 formed at about 100,000 degrees Kelvin. 
And as you go up, above these active regions, th these pictures are all taken at about the same time, except maybe this one, um, you can see that the, the regions start to get bright. Because what we have here are things called, the whole structure around the sunspots called an active region. And the magnetic field is very strong here. It's highly stressed. When these stressed fields north and south collide, they somehow release energy and they heat the gas. Now, as we go higher into the corona, we see the sun as it looks between one and six million degrees. And this is an X-ray picture taken from the Yoko satellite, I think, um, back in around 1991. And here you notice that these fine, detailed structures kind of vanish. It becomes much more smooth everywhere. The, the active regions are still here. They're even more active. But then there are also these dark regions that form up in here. These regions are called coronal holes, and they're caused by the fact that the magnetic field is straight out and just reaches out into space and cannot trap gas. While in here, you'll see later, when I show some pictures, that there are closed loops that trap the gas. And once it's trapped, it's easier to heat. Uh, finally, uh, we have an instrument, we have a coronagraph, which looks at the corona of the sun far, far out. And this is the sun. It's just drawn in here. Uh, and there's an occulting disk. If you don't have this, you can't see this because it's too faint compared to the brightness of the sun. And then the corona of the sun, which is the hot stuff that you see here, stretches way, 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 way out, all the way like that. Okay, so what is our picture of all this mess? Well, if you go back, you're going to go from a highly structured picture here and here to a more amorphous thing, very amorphous out here. And so this is what you get. And it's the magnetic field which does all of that. Uh, these are the magnetic field lines. And as they bulge up and go out into the corona, they expand. And they, when you get up in here, the magnetic field can now push the gas around. Down here, the gas pushes the magnetic field around. Uh, this is the surface of the sun. And then you have all these things that people invented, all the names of structures where the magnetic fields form closed structures or where they go out into space. There's a very funny word here called a fluctosphere. Sphere. I, don't, I don't know what a fluctosphere is, but someday somebody's going to tell me. I don't, yeah, right here, the fluctosphere. So I don't know, that's where things probably fluctuate. At any rate, this is a sort of picture. Now we're trying to understand how all this works and what could heat this. Well, the energy that comes up from the photosphere moves the magnetic fields and, and stresses them. And those stresses propagate upward like this. So one idea is that these moving fields cause the fields up in here to reconnect other field lines and heat the gas. But then there are also waves produced. And as the waves move upwards, there, there's not only acoustic sound waves, but there are electromagnetic waves called alphane waves and fast mode and slow mode waves. And these things, if they dissipate into corona, they could also heat the corona. Okay. So again, just to, to see how all this works in detail, here's a typical white light picture of the sun. And we can extrapolate the magnetic field, on, I should say, on the surface can be measured. Uh, it's measured by a spectroscopic thing called the Zeeman effect. And uh, Becca can tell you all about that if she's here, <laughs> after she talks about women in astronomy. But by a spectroscopic effect, we can measure the magnetic field along the line of sight. That is in our direction. And we can also measure it tangentially, but it's much harder to measure that way. Uh, so white is a, say, north polarity, and black is a south polarity. And these are different field lines. Now, we can extrapolate this field into the corona. And when we do, we get these structures like this, like little magnetic dipoles all over the place. And in here, gas can be trapped. Uh, and this just goes out. And this is what forms the shape of a corona that you see. It's this magnetic structure all around it. And you can see right here the structure. Here you have these closed loops. And as this stuff moves outward, because there's a, the, the whole corona is expanding, there's a solar wind that pushes outward. And when these magnetic loops break off, they form these streamers. So this is what you should look for. All as much detail as you can see in the corona when you're looking at the sun. What you're doing is seeing the magnetic field of the sun. Now, why is plasma trapped in a magnetic field? Well, the magnetic force is, is a strange force. 
Uh, if you take, a, say, a proton or an electron, and it's sitting still in a magnetic field, it won't feel it. It doesn't feel the field at all. If it starts to move, and it moves along the magnetic field, no problem. It can move as fast as it wants, and it doesn't feel the field. No force at all. But if the electron tries to cross the field in this direction, oh, it'll be trapped. And it'll tend to spiral around in a circle around the field. So if it's, it can move along the field line <coughs> in both directions. You can have a velocity component perpendicular to the field and one parallel to the field, and then it'll form a helix and spiral along the field. That's just the nature of the magnetic force. And that's what traps the gas inside the field lines so that you can see these field lines. The gas coming up from the lower surface of the sun, the photosphere and the chromosphere, gets shoved up into these different field lines. Okay, so the field, the sun, as you know, has a sunspot maximum and a sunspot minimum. And the shape of the field changes during that time. Uh, at sunspot minimum, basically you have a dipole, and it looks like this, just comes around and the field will come around like that. And in fact, the previous slide, this is sort of a, uh, a dipole-like structure out here. So, however, the sun rotates differentially. It doesn't rotate at the same speed. It rotates faster at the equator than at the poles. So as a result of that, the magnetic field, the dipolar field, gets pushed and stretched and it gets twisted underneath the surface of the sun by the dynamo effect, and it gets pushed up uh, in through the surface. So this is supposedly a drawing that shows us you have the magnetic flux line like this from north to south, but differential rotation starts to bend it and twist it. And then underneath the sun, it forms these closed things like this, which pop out of the surface. And we call these magnetic loops, or flux tubes. And mass ejections, may originate when these things pop out of the surface and then become unstable, and they just fly off. Why are they unstable? Well, I'm not sure. There, there are codes that calculate this, but the calculations, if anything, on the sun are very difficult because they involve not only uh, the standard, uh, f say, fluid flow, but they also involve the electromagnetic field. So this branch is called magneto uh, electrodynamics, or uh, MHG magnetohydrodynamics, and the calculations become extremely complex. So most, or many models of the sun are very simplified. They're, they're, they're much simpler than the sun is because <laughs> you can't make them more complicated because the codes get too long. So here's another example showing the same sort of effect. You have the poloidal magnetic field lines like this, and then differential rotation sets in and begins to wrap up the field, and you get these strange structures which pop out of the sun in the form of loops. And so when you're looking at solar minimum, uh, there's not much activity on the sun. So these structures here, which get formed from around sunspots, are not very intense. And so you mostly you can see a very, the field will look completely different than at solar maximum. And these are the loop-like structures up close, as seen at well, this is 171 angstroms in the extreme ultraviolet, and it's formed by an uh, iron ion, uh, iron 9. In the, in the solar corona, all the atoms are charged because they're stripped of many of their outer electrons. Uh, so when you get the iron, you can get up to iron 9, 10, 11. That means that, that there are 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 of the 26 electrons removed. And they're, they're removed by collisions because the corona is very hot. It's like a million degrees, so they get removed. And so this is kind of what you see in the corona. You see these cro closed loop-like structures. Here's another one from the satellite called Trace. And at that time, this was the highest resolution solar images we have. Uh, how, how high an image, uh, how high a resolution can we see? Well, uh, we can see down to about a third of an arc second in, the, in a rocket thing that just went up. A rocket. But usually it's about a half an arc second, which is an arc second on the sun is 700 kilometers. So the smallest structures we see are around 300, 200 kilometers. In the visible, you can see smaller structures because the, the visible, the resolution just is higher there. You can make better telescopes as far as resolution goes. Okay, he's just, the sunspots, just to, just to say what I just said, so there's not much, no need to go into this in much detail. The sunspot groups are large, 
they're cooler than about, for about 2,000 degrees cooler than the sun, and you see the granules around them. There's all sorts of motions that occur in the sunspots, too. Okay, so in the solar cycle, what happens is sunspots start to form at about 30 degrees north and south, and this is time down here, and this is lat solar latitude. And as time goes on, the sunspots get closer, they, they come out closer and closer to the equator. Uh, and here, Bill, let's say you have a bipolar sunspot cycle. There's a north-south like magnitude emerging. The, say the polarity here is positive. Uh, the leading spot will have a positive polarity, and, and the other spot will have a negative, and it'll be reversed here. So but when the sunspots get near the equator, the leading polarities of both, uh, of both hemispheres cancel, and the following polarities do something funny. They actually walk back to the, sur to the poles of the sun. The sun has, in addition to differential rotation, in addition to the random walk of the gas pushing the field around, has something called meridional flow. And that is a current that flows from north, from the equators to the poles. And it carries the following polarities of the sunspots. And when they reach the pole, they form, uh, they essentially change the polarities of the north-south poles. And that's why in every 11 years, you get a reversal of the magnetic field of the sun. So this is the way a sunspot maximum occurs. And, and then the, here's the sunspot number as a function of time. And these are all the sunspots that we've seen. Now it turns out that this group of sunspots in here, you see there are lots of spots. This is the biggest solar maximum that has ever been recorded in the history of the sunspot. The people would study this way back in a modern minimum. We lived, we lived, or at least I lived, in a very wonderful time. Because I remember in the 60s looking at uh, drawings I made of the sun, a four-inch reflector, and seeing like 16, 18 spots on the disk of the sun at any one time. So nowadays we don't see it. Then we got around 2009 and 10, and we had a terrible solar minimum. <coughs> And uh, that lasted it, very much like one that we had in 2013. So, and so that's why you're not seeing many sunspots now. So what's going to happen? Uh, well, I'll tell in a minute. Here's an x-ray picture of the sun that shows the huge difference between solar max and solar minimum. So you, this is solar max, and here we are at solar minimum where there aren't many sunspots, there aren't many closed loop structures, and there's lots of open field, and the gas is just cooler and less dense. And here's the, here's the x-ray flux as a function of time down here. Okay, here's another, uh, here's another sunspot uh, image cycle, which shows the Maunder minimum where there were no spots at all. So how do we fit now in this minimum? See this. Here we have these big cycles. These are lar very large cycles. And down here we have one that's very small. Can we predict these? No. When we try to predict them, uh, I think the last predictions for the other cycle, one was this big and one was twice as big. So we can't predict them yet because we don't really understand a dynamo and we don't understand this meridional flow well enough to predict them. The meridional flow is very slow. It's a walking speed. We you walk from the equator to the pole along with the meridional flow. Uh, but the dynamo is not well understood at all. And I know this because I serve on a NASA panel and occasionally we, rev we review proposals. And I got a proposal to review on the dynamo. Somebody was doing calculations on the solar dynamo. And what we're supposed to do is read it and give our impressions. Is it good? Should it be funded? Is it exciting science? So on and so forth. And reading it, I found that this guy was spinning the sun three times faster than it rotates. So well, I know how fast it rotates, so why would you make a model spinning the sun three times faster? So somebody there knew the answer to that and said, well, if he spins his model at the solar rate, then it's going to rotate faster at the poles than at the equator, which we know it doesn't do. So that shows you the state of the dynamo models. Uh, they're, they're quite uncertain at, the, at this time. Okay, so here is another picture of this flow that occurs. The sunspots occur here. This is called the butterfly diagram, these things I'm showing you. And the positive polarity, say this, let's say yellow is positive, is moving down like this, 
And the negative polarity moves back upward like this to the poles and forms now a, a, a polarity at the North Pole, say, that's opposite of the polarity that it had before. Because, and then the positive polarity cancels out with the negative polarity here. And here the negative polarity in this cycle is really the positive polarity and goes down like this. So every 11 years, the sunspot cycle reverses like this. And I believe that if you freeze the meridional flow to be a constant rate, I may be wrong about this, but there's a guy in the audience that knows, Alphonse, if he's here, um, that you won't, sometimes you won't get a change of magnetic field at the poles, and that's not observed. So anyway, the field is doing all this. And why is this all relevant? Well, when you look at an eclipse, its solar maximum, it's going to look different than its solar minimum. Its solar maximum, there's lots of sunspots, and you have lots of these little loops producing flares and mass ejections, and you'll see bright corona all the way around like this, and you see these helmet streamers going off. Well, when you look at solar minimum, uh, things will be much more extended along the corona. Now, this, this thing still has some activity, uh, but, never, and, but here you'll see the strong dipole field. The poloidal field has not been... It's not been destroyed by all these sunspots emerging and wrapping it around and, and twisting it. So we're going back and forth. So right now we're getting near a solar minimum, so it should probably look more like this. So I would look around the pole, around regions to see if you can see streamers like this, and I would look around here and see if you can see helmet structures like this. Okay, what does all this mean when it goes way out in space? Well, um, if you take a look at this streamer right here like this, you have loops like this that close. But because of the solar wind, when you get out here, a northern, this is a north and this is a south pole, say. The, the northern polarity field is going like this, and then it's coming back as a southern polarity like this. So the fields here at this point are in opposite directions. When the fields are in opposite directions, uh, they form a current. And that's called the heliophysics, uh, heliospheric current sheet, which is supposedly the largest thing in the solar system. Here are the planets and here's the Earth. And it forms like a ballerina, ballerina skirt because the sun is tilted on its axis and you have the differential rotation. And because of the spinning around, uh, because of those two effects, it looks like a skirt. Uh, you won't see anything like that. I'm just pointing it out because we're supposed to talk about what we know about the sun, the physics of it. Now, the other thing about the sun is that everything I've shown you has been static. Just pictures. That back in the 70s, that's the way we thought the sun was like that. But it's actually not at all. Now, let's see how well this computer is going to go. The granules are moving around really rapidly. If you push and start this, this should be a movie. Well, OK, we'll start. Here's the sun rotating. And here you see these active regions appearing and producing flares. You, there we go. I don't care which one you start. There's the granules moving around, pushing the field around. And this pushing and sloshing of the field is what we think leads to all the energy that goes into the corona. Then when we get explosions, we get flares of, and mass ejections, and I'll say what might cause those. Then you get the corona, and it shoots gas way out into space like this. And I think there's a big eruption, and this goes all the way past the Earth, and the solar winds from the sun goes all the way out to the edge of the solar system. And again, this is a coronagraph, so this is where the sun is, and this is an occulting disk. That's not Elvis, that's uh, a planet moving along through the field of view. But when we got these data, uh, sometimes we'd do a dark, dark image and not take any data, and we would get letters from people that said, why are you hiding the sun? What went on? What, what, what thing went on? Or when we, we got something like uh, this planet, you'd say, what is that? Or what, and we'd say, well, that's just a planet. And say, no, no, tell us what it really is. <laughs> and, and some kid was w answering some of these letters, and he said, so, well, it's a planet. And the guy wrote back and said, well, you may just be a kid, but I know better than that. I know you, you might as well tell me what it really is. So the sort of thing goes on. This, I think, is like a two-week movie. So you see there, there are structures in both northern and some southern hemisphere, and they're producing mass ejections going outward. Okay, if you go to that one. Um, okay, we have an instrument on stereo spacecraft which looks sideways. 
that's not looking at the sun. So we can see the gas streaming by the Earth. And this is, a, is uh, called, um, uh, it's a difference image. It's, it's an event difference image. Every day, what we do is subtract the previous day from the day we're at. So where, where this thing was is dark because it's moving out, and now it's bright over here, and the next day it'll be reversed. So if you run this as a movie, it's called a running difference. Yeah. Whoops. Go, go back and try one more time. No, it's not going to do it. All right. Uh, what I wanted to show you is we saw comets coming in. So thousands of comets have been seen raising the sun here. That has nothing to do with the physics of the sun at the moment. Uh, that's all right. You go ahead, Alan. Go to, the, go to the next one. Okay, so to show you again the dynamics of the sun, here's the photosphere is moving around and creating all sorts of structures in it which shoot up into space like this. And these are called spicules. And this was taken from space from a white light telescope. And at some time, you see, we want to know what really heats the corona. That's the big question. That's like dark matter. Nobody knows. All the astronomers laughing at us. We can't tell them what heats the corona. We just laugh back and say, well, you don't know what dark matter is either. <laughs> so, and, and both of these problems have been known for a long time. I mean, the, I guess dark matter goes back to Fritz Zwicky in the 30s. And, uh, you know, the, 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 th the corona's hot goes back to sometime in the 40s, the early 40s. But anyway, at any rate, at some point, people thought, well, these spicules are heating the corona. They're just blowing energy up into it. But they don't get hot. They, they, get, they come back and they fall back down. There's a class of spicules recently discovered that are thought might be hot enough to produce some heating. Because there's thousands of times more energy in the, in the chromosphere of the sun, which is that stuff you see with your H-alpha telescopes and white light telescopes, than there is in the corona. The corona isn't very dense. The corona is millions of degrees, but if you have a million degree gas and it's as dense as the surface of the sun, we're history. We'd all be incinerated. All right, if you go on. So, but as you go higher up in the, s in the sun, you do have these, here's the chromosphere of the sun, here's the white light sun, and you get these things called prominences, which are gas about 10,000 degrees, which are suspended in by the magnetic flux tubes. And the flux tubes emerge from the surface, and then they erupt. And one of the games that people play in solar physics is to figure out why they're erupting. So there are various models that when they actually run simulations, they can make the, these prominences erupt, and some of them just sit there quiescently. And you can see that they produce these little bubbles, and these things, are sh these are just probably shockwaves pushing gas upward like that. And it's very highly structured because the fields are all over. It's just like a big gas flame, really, like a fire. Okay. <coughs> Recently, there was a satellite la launched called IRIS, and uh, this should be a movie that'll run. Try to run it. Before we only had to, so the idea is to show you the dynamics of the sun. And so well, what'll happen is, this is an image of the sun at about 70,000 degrees in an ion of silicon, silicon four. Oh, there you go. Look down there and see what happens. Nothing. At any rate, these things are moving and coming all the time. They're heating up. There you go. They come and go. They're explosions. And, and we, we don't know what causes the explosions. But the, the, the main thing that we think causes all the heating is a process called magnetic reconnection. And what that is is this. If I take a magnetic field and it's north, and I have a north pole this way and a south pole this way, when they intersect, they will annihilate each other. Well, the field has energy, so it can't annihilate. So what happens? Well, what happens is we, the topology of the field, we think, changes, and it, it shoots out jets of material in either end, and that's where the magnetic energy is going. It's, it's into these jets and heats the gas inside or produces shock waves which come out of it and heat gas above and below. So all these jets and things like this are explained by magnetic, uh, um, essentially magnetic reconnection. That's what's believed to be the, the source of it. So, but if you look at the sun here in white light below the surface of this 70,000 degree gas, uh, you will see little magnetic dipoles that come together and annihilate. That's the idea of it. And that's the idea that would explain flares and coronal mass ejections. Okay. 
Okay, so here's an image made actually in a, in a series of temperatures of an active region. And I just want to show you how the temperatures vary in the active region. This is a movie. But if you go down here, you'll get a... Yeah, go ahead. And it starts out in helium-2, which is like 100,000 degrees. And then it goes to higher temperatures, magnesium-6. And you're going up from 100,000 to 200,000. And it goes higher and higher. And you notice how the structure of changes from things that are very sharp. And you're going to see it's getting more and more amorphous and smooth as you approach the corona. Here's iron-11 in a million degrees or so. And iron-12 in a million degrees. And we're going to go finally up to iron-15, which iron-16, which is the highest temperatures we can reach, three or four million degrees with, with this, unless there's a flare, this is as high temperatures we can reach. And this shows you w we weren't able to do this before, to take an active region and go around it and uh, measure all these structures. And it's done with a spectrometer that essentially scans the active region, and then we just integrate over all the velocities that we can get from the spectrometer and stack the images, and we can get pictures of the image like this in monochromatic images in different spectral lines. So this is around um, 4 million degrees, and it's a monochromatic image. There are no colder temperatures in it. When you look at a lot of the images you see from uh, instant, like the Solar Dynamics Observatory, they're not monochromatic because the filters they have allow lines of different temperatures to essentially emit within the filter band pass. Here, only this line appears. Okay. So here you see what happens with this magnetic reconnection process is you get these eruptions all the time in flares and you see them in x-rays. And this can affect communications on the Earth, by especially the ionosphere. And here's the big one over here. And you see all these loops. You see what forming all these closed structures because that's what the magnetic field does. Okay, so I just want to show you how dynamic the sun is. And it's this dynamics. And here's, here is the model, now a theory of the flare. Here's the magnetic reconnection I was telling you about. You have field lines going one way this way and the other way the other way. And they approach each other. And gas is, is flowing in and pushing them together. When they get together, this magnetic energy gets converted into kinetic energy and produces jets, which go like this. The jets that go downward uh, essentially heat the chromosphere of the sun, either with particles or just by conduction. And then this bubbles gas up from the chromosphere and makes the loop much denser and easier to see in the x-rays and makes loop structures like this. So this is a solar flare. Now this thing going outward produces a solar mass ejection and it produces a thing that you see far away. And these things all essentially affect the corona that you'll be seeing. Right now we don't have many flares and we don't have as many mass ejections, so the corona will be more be benign and structured more along the equator. Here's an example of a flare and look at all the, it's gonna look like a slinky in the end because all this gas that's blown up is, struc is structured in loops. But you see that under really understanding this is not, a, it's not simple. Where does it start? And why, why is it propagating along all these lines? There are all sorts of theories of why it's done, but the basic physics is believed to be this process, magnetic reconnection, right in here. Whoops. I hit, I hit the button of death. All I did was check the battery, I think. <laughs> Oh, there we go, okay. I will try to avoid the button of death. Okay, so here's the mass ejection going out. The, uh, this is the flare, and this is the mass ejection, and it sends out cooler plasma about 120,000 degrees. It's essentially under this, this eruption. And then the shock wave of the, the blast coming out and the jets coming out, squeeze the corona into these, into these loop-like structures, which are now believed to be like in the shape of a croissant. These contain sometimes highly energetic particles. And some of these particles are trapped. They're in the, in the corona to begin with, but then they get energized by the shock wave that hits them. And when these things are loaded with the energetic particles and come to the Earth, they can destroy the satellites by 
they can enter the satellite, even though the detector may be buried deep in the metal, secondary collisions inside the structure eventually makes particles that <coughs> smear up the detectors and cause all sorts of communications interruptions and everything. The Navy is the largest user of space, so that's why the Naval Research Laboratory cares about the sun, because otherwise they wouldn't give a damn about coronal heating. I mean, that's not important to the Navy. <laughs> But what is important is what coronal heating might do to their communication systems and so on and so forth. So here's another uh, sort of cartoon of these loops that form this, this magnetic reconnection and form this coronal mass ejection. In fact, somebody's joking that when two solar physicists discuss solar physics, it goes like this, blah, 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 magnetic reconnection. <laughs> <laughs> So no one's ever proved it, but many people think, in fact, waves, alphane waves, and that heat the corona. In fact, somebody took the data from my experiment, the one, one of the spectroscopy thing, and they wrote a paper saying that alphane waves heated the corona. It was solving the big problem, like finding the holy grail. And it was basically ignored because the problem with all these theories is that the guy that doesn't believe in, believes in some in the magnetic reconnection can find a flaw somewhere in the, in the model, or can say, well, you didn't take into account this and this, and that's gonna cancel out your effect. And that that's happens to all this stuff. So th there's no theory that can produce a telltale sign that's un un unambiguous. It's like going to the doctors and saying, you know, I've got a sore elbow, why? And there are a million possible reasons. So no one can prove anything absolutely, and no one can disprove anything absolutely, but it's just because the sun's complicated. It's just very asymmetric as you can see. Only symmetric problems are really easy to solve. So here again is this big, here's a shock wave coming out in a mass ejection, and here's some examples of what these things look like. They're all screwy looking things too. And then when the mass ejection comes out, this is again a coronagraph image, and you see this thing expanding outward, and when it hits the Earth and hits a satellite, it produces all these secondary emissions in the detector, and hopefully doesn't destroy the detector, but just messes it up for a bit. And that's the kind of thing that we worry about here on the Earth. It's called space weather. And finally, here is a movie of mass ejections, uh, and you can see how they look. They're all the shapes are all different. So the corona you see is depending on all these dynamical events occurring on the sun. There may be a big flare of the day of the eclipse just to prove that me wrong that it's going to we're going to have a spherical magnetic field. Uh, so I don't know, but there's, the, there's Elvis again. Mine here. Uh, that's just bleeding out of a CD image, as you can see. Um, at any rate, uh, I'm hoping that you all have a good uh, eclipse experience. Uh, here are the big questions of solar astrophysics. I gave a talk at a Novak Astronomy Day several years ago. They have, and it hasn't changed. No one's solved a single one yet. <laughs> the, the main one is what heats the corona, the solar corona, and what role does the sun's magnetic field play in causing solar flares and coronal mass ejects, and how, <coughs> how does this reconnection work? Is it really working? No one really knows how the solar wind is accelerated, uh, and we don't really know how the solar dynamo magnetic really, magnetic dynamo really works. Um, do we completely understand the solar interior? Yeah, pretty well. I think maybe this was, an but it was answered before I wrote this. Uh, I just had to put something positive in here, so <laughs> it wouldn't be depressing. I think we understand the, the inside of the sun pretty well. Um, there is a two spacecraft that are going up. One's called Solar Probe Plus. It's going to go very close to the sun. I know three tenths of the solar, three, three solar tenths. Of about a third of the solar radius is going to get really close. Now, all the new missions will claim to solve all these problems. And all the ones that have been flown, and the, the ones I'm associated with supposedly solve these problems, but it's hard. But no one is going to pay you to say, I want to see what a speaker looks like in the upper right-hand corner of the sun on Thursday. So you really have to say you, you want to try to solve it, and we do try to solve the big problems. So every mission is giving more and more information, valuable information, and it's helping to, we're slowly converging, I think, on really understanding what's going on. So 
Here's the thing I'm just reviewing when I told you magnetic energy from the convection zone is probably the ultimate driver of everything. And then heating by magnetic reconnection, the way this process occurs in this corona without a flare produces little nanoflares in those loops I showed you. And they, they just go on all, all, all the time and they wind up heating it. And then you can have alphane waves. Now these elect hydromagnetic waves that, that could also do it. And then this mass, you just throw up big blobs of energy from, from the chromosphere, blobs of mass and heat it. But that, um, that's another idea that's being been tossed around now. Uh, I, you probably know about these things where you can find out a lot of things. If you go to Solar Monitor, you get the solar images on a daily basis, and you can see what happened in, say, 2008, if you want, and you can get X-ray data. Uh, there's a thing called J. Helia Viewer, which gives you images from the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory. You can run movies of current and past activity, and there's this, act, this organization called NOVAC. They're really pretty nice. <laughs> they can teach you how to learn to observe the sun and learn how to observe all the other stars in the rest of the universe, too. So, so anyway, um, thank you for paying attention to this. <laughs> for a lot. <laughs> I'll be happy to answer any questions. I was wondering if you just while you're talking, put up the one, the very first slide of the yeah. interior of the sun. You want to see that again? Oh, I, I, I do remember, uh, but I, okay. Yeah, because that was the last question you said you started Yeah, right. I, well, you think it would be harder because you can't see it, but uh, so, so we have a way of seeing it because the surface of the sun is like, has all these, spic these granules I talked about. Uh, there's acoustic noise. The sun, the sun actually resonates like an acoustic ball. The acoustic waves penetrate deep into the sun. And they have, re they have uh, normal modes. And these normal modes can be studied. There's a, um, they've been studied for many years by the Global Oscillations, Oscillations Network Group. And they've connected all these normal modes and they can actually tell you what structure of the sun inside from acoustic observations in the, in the, photosp in the photosphere. Yeah, and not, not only that, the models of stellar evolution are much more solid because this, and basically they're symmetric, they're radial. It's true the sun rotates differentially and all that stuff, but they basically radiate completely. And so and they're basically symmetric. And they've been solved, the people working on stars have got models of stars. You know, all the elements in our bodies are created in the cores of big stars, supergiants and giant stars. So this, this part is understood pretty well. Uh, not everything is this convective zone. The dynamo isn't well understood here, but I think we know that there's a, the proton-proton cycle. One of these cycles occurs in the, in the core of the sun is producing most of the energy. Then there's a neutrino problem. Uh, we measured the neutrinos coming out of the sun in various energies, and they actually agree with theory. They didn't for many years, but then they found out that neutrinos had a, we didn't understand neutrinos. And when the neutrino physics was finally worked out, uh, the standard models of the sun on the inside agreed pretty much with what we saw. So we n it's not perfect, but sure better than the corona book. No. George, um, uh, Euro just uh, sent. Uh, just gave me a Back, which is relevant. Uh, the speaker is saying the sun's atmosphere is a super hot plasma governed by magnetohydrodynamic forces. And the audience says, ah, yes, of course. And what the audience is thinking is, whenever I hear the word magnetohydrodynamic, <laughs> my brain just replaces it with magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's actually the best answer. You know, that, that's maybe. maybe. <laughs> Oh, the caption is magnetohydrodynamics combines the intuitive nature of Maxwell's equations with the easy solvability of the Navier-Stokes equations. It is so straightforward, yes. physicists add relativistic or quantum just to keep it from getting boring. Oh, it's worse than that. It's worse than that because actually to understand 
reconnection, you need to do particle physics as well. There's the Boltzmann equation. You mentioned that. So the Boltzmann, so it, it's a real mess. And a lot of the models are 2D. So you've got fields that are coming together like this. But in, in reality, they could do this and this, yeah. <laughs> and you wouldn't get any reconnection. None so of the usual simplifications apply. They're free, and I, another thing I failed to mention was that in the reconnection region, we, feel part, we know particles are accelerated to kilovolt and MeV energies, and these propagate down into the chromosphere and produce huge eruptions at, at 20 million degrees in the chromosphere. Uh, they're called hard X-ray bursts because they're much less, the, the X-ray energy is much less than an angstrom. And the models for those things, there used to be a problem. These are all electrons moving down, and they produce a lot of energy, and the models would predict that the whole corona would be essentially drained of all of its electrons in a second <laughs> with these models. And so that created something called the number problem, and the number problem gets solved by having a reverse current which carries the electrons back. But all these things are very difficult. Uh, so I'm not making fun here of the theorists in any way. They're really hard. And that's one reason we haven't solved these, uh, these problems in detail. You George, had I, had, I had one question relevant to one of your pictures in the eclipse itself. Um, <laughs> you, had a, you had a photograph of uh, a uh, very high dynamic range from Druckmüller. Um, yeah. And I know, in, in looking at some stuff for the eclipse, I know he was actually trying to do 3D modeling based on eclipse photography. Do you mm -hmm. know if he made any progress, and are they still trying to do it at this, at this eclipse? I, I don't know. I don't know. Because we're going to have, what, a couple of hours of actual imagery? Yeah. That people will be taking a lot of pictures. No, I, d I don't know if, he's, if that's okay. successful or not. Um, you said earlier that the uh, sun rotates faster at the poles than at the equator, correct? It, ro it rotates faster at the equator. It rotates faster, oh, faster at the equator than it does. I said this model produced the yeah. model produced the opposite effect. If you okay. rotated the sun at the right rate, it gave you the wrong answer for the differential rotation. Is is that rotation of the corona or of the uh, the differential rotation? It's in, in the photosphere of the sun. It's in the, the sunspots. The, okay, the so the core of the sun rotates. Um, with the oh, the core of the sun, I think, rotates like a solid body. It doesn't. It doesn't differentially rotate. Okay. I think that's correct, right? Is Alphonse saying that? So. Yes, we Captain Nemo is going to get into. Oh, oh, I was just going to make a fun comment. You challenged me, so I Google Fluxosphere. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. It's the name of a song by a Russian group called Cosmonaut. Nice. I, so there you go. You see, there's some things in the sun we really did understand. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, you had a question, John. The yeah. temperatures that you're referencing, how are those temperatures determined? Uh, the coronal temperatures are determined by... You want to ionize something and you produce like iron 13 or 14, you need a certain energy to do it. You have to kick out those electrons. So the corona's essentially got a lot of electrons in it moving around, free energy. And they hit an iron ion, they kick out an electron. And the, and the more energetic those electrons are, the more electrons can be kicked out. So they measure basically, well, how hot does it have to be to produce a lot of, say, iron 14, which has 13 electrons removed? Iron one has no, iron one is neutral. And then you, you can get an idea of the temperature that way. When it goes up to iron 16, you know, well, it took more energy to do that. So you have to balance the rate of ionization from the ions with the rate at which the electrons recombine on the ions. And they recombine by radiative recombination. They fall into energy levels and emit radiation and by another process called dielectronic recombination. The balanced collisional ionization with radiative and dielectronic recombination. And then the abundance of the ion in the corona as a function of temperature will go up as it gets hotter and then go down. And each ion will have a curve like that. I, I, give a th I actually gave a talk to last on the Seven Star Party on all this, so you can see this. I have this all. Okay. And that's, how, that's, one, that's the way the temperature is determined in the corona. One thing I didn't discuss in the corona is what is it? What's it made? What is its composition? 
Now you may say, oh, well, I know the, the composition of the sun is, can, uh, does, does this, I think that explanation yeah. for the temperature uh, can also add that uh, you work with instruments that actually observe spectra. Yes. You, use the you have instruments that observe these spectra, and you can identify the spectral lines that come up. So you get things like iron 13 and iron 14 that you can identify by comparing with uh, various lab experiments and things. And uh, when you see those lines come up, then you know that those temperatures are being created. So, yeah. and then that's the rest of the story. I decided not to show any spectra. Because usually spectra is a people. You know, <laughs> they, they fade with the spade, you know. So uh, it's, if you look at spectra, you can see these lines coming up. Now, you measure composition that way too. And in the photosphere, you measure the composition of the front of the lines that Becker talks about. And the photosphere has a certain composition. Its composition is different than the corona. A little bit. It fluctuates. And I don't want to get into it now, by, but when the, ion, when the ions, and it fluctuates not based on the ionization potential of iron 14 or 13, it's the first ionization. How much energy does it take to remove the very first electron? And that's done in the chromosphere. The stuff in the corona is coming up from the chromosphere and there's a process, there's a force called the ponder motor force. It's not like gravity or a, a force of nature. It's a plasma force. And if, if ions are ionized, this force can move them up or move them down. And it is actually changing the abundance of the, of the corona from the photosphere. And I don't want, there's no time to talk about it now, but it's what I'm working on. It's very interesting for me now. So in some places, the sun looks like stars. These stars have the inverse kind of corona that the sun does. So in terms of this abundance. So you can do a lot with spectroscopy. You can also measure the motions. As, as Alphonse said, when you have a spectral line, its width, its shape, tells you how fast things are moving. And its exact wavelength tells you, well, the, the width of it will tell you how turbulent it is and what its temperature is. And if you shift the line, that means it's moving at you. It'll give you the radial velocity along the line of sight. I think, uh, I think we have to move on. Um, I thought that all these talks would go short. And would have, we, well, we're having good discussions, so this is yeah. going very well. But let's thank uh, George again. <laughs> and we're going